different time zones. It's a pleasure to welcome you to this webinar at the margins of the WTO Committee on Rules of Origin. This is the second event that we are holding on what drives the utilization of trade preferences. And I am once again happy to see that there are so many in there, there is so much interest on rules of origin and other factors that influence the utilization of trade preferences. My name is Laura Gauer. I am delegate of the Permanent Mission of Switzerland to the WTO, and I'm currently serving as vice chairperson of the Committee on Rules of Origin at the WTO. As you will hear more in a minute, the committee is a unique forum that WTO members can use to discuss the disciplines that regulate the use of rules of origin and share their experiences on monitoring of utilization of trade preferences. In fact, high levels of utilization necessarily indicate that firms are able to comply with preferential rules of origin and origin requirements, and hence qualify for preferential tariff treatment. On the contrary, low utilization rates may indicate that certain factors hinder the ability or willingness of firms for making full use of preferential agreements and duty saving opportunities. Such hindering factors could be, for instance, restrictive or complex origin criteria, difficulties related to certification of origin, or strict direct shipment obligations. Apart from the origin related elements, other factors could also influence the ability or willingness of firms to utilize preferences, such as the preferential tariff margins, awareness by, by business or operators that uh, preference is available, or the perception that risks or compliance, compliance costs are too high. Better understanding these factors and identifying them with precision can be a key tool for policymakers in the context of expert promotion strategies. Policies to build the capacity of the private sector um, and trade facilitation reforms. The objective of this second webinar is to further explore the factors that drive the utilization of trade preferences. It will be an opportunity to hear the experiences of four additional WTO members and the European Free Trade Association Secretariat. First, however, I will hear, we will hear a brief recap about the work that the WTO Secretariat has been doing in this area. You will be able to use the question and answer function to send in your questions. We will address the questions after all presentations have been made. So without any further introduction, let me ask the WTO Secretariat to be, begin with its presentation. Darlan Marty works at the Market Access Division of the WTO and is Secretary of the Committee on Rules of Origin. Thomas Verbit is a statistician at the WTO Economic Research and Statistics Division. Darlan and Thomas, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Laura, and uh, a very good morning or a very good uh, afternoon or evening to colleagues joining us for this webinar. I'll have the pleasure of introducing some of the work that the WTO Secretariat has been doing in this area, and I'll be co-presenting with Thomas, as uh, Laura explained. But I'd also like to acknowledge the fact that this work uh, has contributions from other colleagues in the division as well, including Simone, who you will hear uh, from in a second, and also uh, Nana, who works with us in the team. So uh, this is really teamwork. Um, in terms of what I'd like to do now is just give a very quick overview about the work that the WTO Secretariat has been doing on preference utilization, and then finish with a few sentences about perhaps um, how we could play a more active role uh, and a more con um, um, make a, a more positive contribution to this debate, provided, of course, the WTO members have an interest uh, in, in, in us doing that in this area. So, the origin of the work of the WTO and particularly the Committee on Rules of Origin on preference utilization goes back to 2005 and a commitment made by WTO ministers of trade that the rules of origin in the preferences for least developed countries should be simple and transparent. And that commitment was further elaborated upon uh, by in two ministerial decisions, one in 2013 and another one in 2015, which give more detailed provisions and examples and illustrations of practices that could be considered simple and transparent when it comes to facilitating the exports of LDCs um, to preference granting members. 
And particularly in 2015, the decision says that the WTO Secretariat could calculate utilization rates. Now, the question is, why do we calculate utilization rates and, and what is utilization rates? What's the purpose of this? And um, in the next slide, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a more detailed um, uh, presentation about the methodology through, that we use for the calculation of utilization rates. But in a nutshell, utilization rates are a marker or an indicator that uh, we can utilize in order to measure and to monitor the effectiveness of uh, trade preferences and preferential rules of origin. So in reality, um, utilization rates are not necessarily an end in and of themselves, but rather a, uh, um, a tool or a marker, as I said, that can be used for more informed policy decisions. So decisions, for instance, to uh, update a preferential agreement, uh, remove bottlenecks if bottlenecks are found to be hindering the utilization of preferences, or uh, simplify origin requirements if that is also relevant. Now, this is a quick slide that shows um, the formula that we utilize to calculate utilization of trade preferences. Um, and as you can see there at the top of the slide, basically utilization rates is calculated as the proportion of trade that receives preferences in practice out of the total trade that would be eligible for preferences. So it is a comparison between the actual benefits that are received over the total benefits that could be received under a trade agreement. Now, this of course needs or requires a preference to exist. In other words, there must be a preferential tariff margin so that a benefit can be offered. And this is why in the work that the Secretariat conducts, we exclude tariff lines where the rates on a most favored nation basis is zero. So if the rate is zero, we don't take into account because uh, those lines, because um, our premise is that no preference can be offered for those lines. But for all the other lines, we take a look at, as I said, we take a look at the trade that received preferences out of the total that could have received preferences. Now, from this definition, you can see that utilization rates are always agreement specific. They're always concerned a specific preferential scheme. And this can be misleading when we have overlapping preferences available. And the table that you see here on screen is a good example of that. If we take the European Union, you will see that exports of vanilla from Madagascar to the European Union can use two preferences, what we here have called LDC PTA and other. And basically, you can see that if we look at only the LDC preference, there's an utilization of only 4%. So only 4% of exports of vanilla are receiving preferences in the European Union when they are imported from Madagascar. Now, that's the utilization rate for that product under that agreement. But as you can see here, that's a misleading conclusion because in reality, there are other preferences available. Um, in this case, it's an economic partnership agreement between Madagascar and the European Union. And as you can see there, the preference utilization is very high, 94%. So the Secretariat also complemented this notion of utilization rates with another marker or indicator that we've called underutilization or non-utilization. And in this case, you can see that only 2% of uh, vanilla coming from Madagascar is not receiving any preference in the EU market. And what we do then with this is when we find high levels of non-utilization, we try to dig deeper to understand what the reasons for that non-utilization uh, could be. And by doing that, uh, we have, uh, I have here referenced a number of notes that the WTO Secretariat has prepared on this topic. Um, they are all available through the WTO website. And I think that the conclusions we came to um, are uh, summarized here. And I think the first one is that all preferential schemes, all members that have preferences with the LDCs 
have to some extent some underutilization or some non-utilization of the preferences. And this might be normal. That's perhaps, in fact, uh, partly the purpose of rules of origin and making sure that there is substantial transformation in the countries that are beneficiaries of preferences. However, what we also found is that there are very big variations in the level of utilization or in the level of non-utilization across LDCs, across sectors, and across preferential schemes. So for a same product and an identical origin requirement, we might have very high or very low levels of utilization depending on the exporting LDC. And that, of course, raises questions about why some LDCs are better able to utilize preferences than others. And also when we see big variations across sectors, that also raises the question about why in some sectors the utilization is low. And this is particularly true when we find very simple origin requirements. If we take agricultural products, for instance, or mineral products that are subject to the wholly obtained rule, we also find low utilization or non-utilization there. So a big question is that why, why that is so. Another finding from our work is that there's very high volatility in the level of utilization, and that perhaps is a bit surprising. We could imagine that trade from the LDCs fluctuates one year to the other, but it's less clear why one year after the other they might be utilizing preferences to a greater or lesser extent. And finally, um, I think our work also indicated that landlocked LDCs seem to have greater difficulties in utilizing trade preferences than LDCs with C access. Now, the hypothesis that we have made to explain that non-utilization or those variations of utilization, some of, the, some of this hypothesis relates to origin requirements, um, not only the origin criteria, but also proofs of origin and direct transportation requirements. But we could also make a number of other hypotheses, as we also heard during the event that we held last year, a number of speakers mentioned other um, factors that could be influencing the ability or the willingness of firms to utilize trade preferences. And I've listed um, them here. Now, to finish um, um, off this part of the presentation before I hand over to Thomas, I'd like to mention perhaps how we could improve our understanding of these issues and how we could be playing a more active role uh, there. And I've listed here eight ideas where the WTO as an organization, but also the WTO secretariat could be playing a more active role and, and making a contribution to this debate. I think the first one is to raise awareness about the usefulness of the concept of um, preference utilization. The more we understand how this works and the more, the more governments utilize this to monitor their own uh, preferences, the more experiences we will have to share in this area. And in this context, I think we can assist governments that are interested in undertaking work in this area. We can assist them with the methodology that is necessary, and we can also assist them with the data collection that is necessary to undertake this work. And I think that by doing that, we also would achieve more standardization in the way the data is collected, in the way utilization rates are uh, calculated and therefore have more comparable studies um, across WTO members. And in that context, I think the committees here at the WTO would play, could play um, a very active role in offering a forum where members can exchange more information about this, uh, exchange more experiences about trade facilitating measures, but also me uh, perhaps measures that are hindering the utilization of preferences. And then um, there are two additional areas, I think, where we could be playing a, a more active role. One is as a depository for rules of origin and origin requirements in the FTAs. We are already doing that. And for members that notify their agreements to us, all these uh, rules of origin and origin requirements are available at the tariff line level in a database that is available called the origin facilitator, which appears here on screen. And then what I'd like to propose as well is that we could be making a more active utilization of the WTO databases for the notification of preferential data, because if we have more data available in the secretariat, then members could themselves access preferential imports 
and therefore avoiding avoid having to negotiate data sharing agreements, uh, bilateral data sharing agreements with each other. And particularly on this point, I'd like to hand over to, to Thomas, who will say a few words about our databases and how that data is notified to us. Thomas? Thank you, Dalan, and hello, everyone. <clears throat> As mentioned, preferential tariffs and import statistics play a key role in trying to understand better the use of preferential trade agreements. And as Dala mentioned, I think we can count ourselves lucky to have an infrastructure already in place which allows for the collection and maintenance of such data. Let me go a few years back to the year 1987. Back then, the Council of the General Agreement of Tariffs and Trade, in short, GUD, launched the integrated database with the aim to store official, updated, reliable, and complete data sets. The idea was to have one source of information which would serve as the basis for reviews, to carry out assessments, to facilitate negotiations and tariff concessions. And I think this is still a very valid assumption. Now, more recently in the year 2019, members agreed to revisit the modalities and operation of the integrated database. Um, this, this GM, 367 GMA 367 this document outlining the operation of the integrated database um, had a more inclusive character it made reference to the RTA transparency mechanism and also to the PTA transparency mechanism and even the latest declaration by the MSME group refers to the IDB as a repository of relevant data summarizing the decision reads that members shall notify applied MFN tariffs and annual import statistics and are encouraged to notify preferential tariffs and preferential import statistics, the kind of data we need to calculate preference utilization. Once we receive these files, we do the following. The Secretariat standardizes the data, we harmonize and validate the data sets and we load them to the integrated database. At the end of this process, is the dissemination of the data, or from a user perspective, the management of the access to that data. As we have seen, in order to be able to calculate preference utilization, we need to know the value of products entering under a specific agreement, here highlighted in the table with the red box. The same product with the same national tariff line number from the same origin might enter under the MFN duty scheme, might enter under preferential agreement or even another one, as we've seen in the case of Madagascar's exports to the European Union. We started with members notifying imports under the non-reciprocal, largely GSP LDC duty scheme, as these are a requirement arising from the preferential trade arrangements and transparency mechanism. Over time, we noticed that some members submitted imports under all different preferential arrangements in place, including imports under RTAs and FTAs. And there are good reasons to do so, not only from a transparency perspective. Many governments are interested in how their exports make use of the agreements, but they depend on data from customs of the importing partner. And I understand that, that some countries, members have um, come into agreements when they sign RTAs or bilateral agreements, um, that they do share some data sharing agreements here. Um, at this moment in time, we have one or more data sets from the members listed in the box on the green side. Um, you see there are a number of uh, members where which we would have both the non-reciprocal, the PTA dimension, but also the bilateral RTA dimension. Um, and then for others, um, only the PTA dimension or only the RTA dimension. Now, to continue, you might have asked yourself, how can I access this data? The Notification obligations at this moment in time only stipulate that members with non-reciprocal preferential duty schemes 
should notify. And at this moment in time, we only publish this data at the level of multilateral trade negotiation categories at the dedicated PTA website. Information on the tariff line level is available through the tariff analysis online. It's partly restricted for authorized users only. However, both systems do not really cater for presenting information of a bilateral trade agreement, say, for example, the EU-Canada agreement. So we are currently in the process of rethinking how we could present these online platform interfaces and are in the process of trying to understand better how we could publish the data in a way to facilitate access without creating problems of confidentiality. On the data receiving side, the data we receive from members, from delegates, um, the new IDB decision takes account of advances in technology over the last 20 years. One aspect is to facilitate data notifications, and many delegates know that this is not always a straightforward process, and it is recurring twice a year. To this end, there are basically two new ways we have been engaging with members. There are some for which we engage directly, for example, with Canada or Uruguay, where in the case of Canada, we are allowed to download information from a public website. In the case of Uruguay, Uruguay pushes data to a secured SFTP server, both from the National Central Bank and also from customs. Then there are economies who use the ASICUDA system. ASICUDA is a customs management software system managed by UNCTAD, and it's used by more than 100 economies around the world, in particular by least and less developed countries, where data compilation and availability is sometimes less straightforward. We have been able to secure funding, extra budgetary funding, to develop and integrate a module in the operating system of Asakuda World. As a member, you need to activate this module. Once the module is activated, um, the authorities need to identify the data fields and the periodicity and the data is then submitted to a secure server environment to the WTO automatically in the intervals agreed to. We have put this place in this, this in place with Madagascar. We are in very advanced stage with Cote d'Ivoire and are currently also implementing in Togo. And I hope we will find more countries who are willing to engage with us on these automatic data exchanges. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, to both of you. As I said before, if you have questions or comment um, on these pres presentations, I encourage you to send them through um, the chat or the question and answer function. We will revert to them uh, shortly. The next session will be moderated by another colleague from the WTO Secretariat. Simon Neumüller is an Economic Affairs Officer at the Market Access Division. Simon, over to you. Thank you, Laura. And uh, welcome also from my side to everybody to this meeting today. The topic of today's roundtable discussion is monitoring the utilization of trade preferences and examining the impact of rules of origin on preference utilization. And is not, this is not only interesting by itself, it is moreover highly relevant to the discussions of the WTO's committee on rules of origin, as we just heard, and on the role that rules of origin play in this regard. Let me also welcome uh, from my side, our distinguished speakers from Canada, Chile, the European Free Trade Association Secretariat, Turkey and the United States uh, to this roundtable discussion today. We will first hear of these five presentations and will then engage in a discussion. And uh, for this, I would like to invite all attendees to use the Q&A function um, so we can uh, address those questions in the later part of the session. Given that Canada and Chile are joining us remotely today, and it is still very early morning there, we will hear the speakers in reverse alphabetical order, and hence uh, we will start with the United States. We're happy to have with us today, Mr. Ken Shigetomi, Director for Multilateral Non-Tariff Barriers at the Office of the US Trade Representative. He is an expert in rules of origin, technical barriers to trade, and trade preferences in general. 
Kent, we look forward to your presentation. You have the floor. Thank you and welcome to everyone. Uh, my presentation today will cover mostly unilateral trade preferences of the United States. Uh, and where applicable, I'll contrast that with some of the uh, US free trade agreement preferences. So <clears throat> the first thing I wanted to point out is that how different the United States system is from that of other WTO members. First, as you can see, we have five unilateral preference programs for the Pacific Islands, our GSP program, the Caribbean program, which itself consists of three separate programs, the African Growth and Opportunity Act or AGOA and preferences for Nepal. And you note that some of these preferences are based on geographic area, while others like the Generalized System of Preferences or GSP are not. And it's quite possible, and in fact happens frequently, that beneficiaries are, uh, are covered under more than one preference program. To add to the situation, these individual programs have different product coverages. So the US has approximately 11,200 tariff lines under its system. Uh, and you can see the differences in coverage uh, very significantly between the US uh, programs. The rules of origin that we apply under our unilateral preferences are based on a regional value content. This differs from the rules of origin that are applied under US free trade agreement, which generally rely on a tariff shift uh, method. So this gives you a quick overview of the uh, major US preference program. As I said, the Caribbean program has three parts the underlying uh, program, which is permanent, then the uh, supplementary Caribbean base and trade partnership preferences, and the Haiti specific preferences. I don't, you'd also can see that they all have different expiration dates. The African Growth and Opportunity Act or AGOA, the Nepal preferences and a GSP. Under the US system, the rule of origin that we apply is based on the amount of originating content of the good as a percentage of the good's value. And it generally requires an RVC content of 35%. And there you can see the formula that is applied to determine regional value content. There are uh, some exceptions. So for instance, apparel products under the AGOA are generally subject to a simple cut and sew rule, which allows for third country fabric to be used in the production of garments. And accumulation is also handled differently under US preference programs. The generally they allow accumulation with other beneficiaries in the same geographic area. So for instance, AGOA beneficiaries can accumulate with one another, Caribbean uh, with uh, other beneficiaries. And with the GSP program, accumulation is allowed with other GSP beneficiaries in the same geographic area. We have a wealth of data uh, on preference utilization, which can be found at the website of the US International Trade Condition Commission. There you can see the URL. And I would encourage anyone who is interested in downloading or uh, conducting a data search to create a free uh, account and that will allow you to access the USITC data. Uh, in addition, we also submit annual reports to the WTO as a condition of our waiver for uh, the various individual US preference programs. Finally, this slide highlights some of the domestic reporting that the United States conducts on each of its preference programs. Uh, I won't go into this in detail, but uh, all of these reports are available online. What has been the effect of US trade preference programs? Well, what we've seen is that numerous industries have developed 
to take advantage of the benefits. So for instance, in Sub-Saharan Africa, we've, allowed, we've seen that the um, provisions that allow for third country fabrics has allowed uh, beneficiaries to build industries uh, to take advantage of those preferences. We also see uh, the growth of apparel exports from Haiti uh, in the Caribbean, which has led to the creation of uh, jobs and exports. With respect to our GSP program, we've seen the growth in the production of travel goods in Southeast Asia, which has become the largest category uh, utilized under GSP. And rum from Jamaica is another leading beneficiary under our Caribbean preference program. However, what we have seen uh, interestingly is that preferences are not always utilized even for those goods where origin would be fairly simple to establish. So for instance, from wholly originating goods. So if you look at kidney beans, which are simply are gonna be wholly originating in the country where they, where they are produced, we can see a fluctuation in the utilization rates that swing between 2.2% and 20.2%. And this goes back to something that was on Darlin's slide where the utilization rates may vary significantly from year to year. I don't have a good explanation uh, about how this could happen because you would assume that the producers of kidney beans would continue to do so year after year and would therefore become um, knowledgeable about what benefits there were, they were entitled to. So it is confusing about why utilization would vary so significantly in the same beneficiary from year to year. The next example here is in, for crude petroleum. And you can see the US tariffs there. Uh, and again, here we see that AGOA preferences are utilized less than half of the time. 41.3% in 2021, in 2020, only 38.5%. So I recognize that given the price of crude petroleum, 10.5% 10.5 cents is a fairly minuscule uh, percentage of the price of petroleum. But it is confusing to me about why the utilization rate would be so low. It may have something to do with the fact that it is hard to physically segregate petroleum from one source or another at a refining center. So uh, typically the oil would be combined at the refinery and you wouldn't be able to say, well, that tank came from this country and that tank of petroleum came from a second country. So the question is, does the tariff rate have an effect on the utilization of preferences? In other words, if the tariff rate is higher, do we see a rise in utilization rates? If you look at something like, again, vanadium, a mineral vanadium oxide, which again is gonna be uh, wholly originating, our tariff rate is five and a half percent. There, the, util the utilization rate is approximately 90% uh, of total uh, imports from uh, beneficiaries in Africa. For men's and boys undergarments in subheading 6107.99, our tariff rate is significantly high, 14.9%, and the utilization rate is 99.9%. For t-shirts in heading, subheading 6109.10, the tariff rate is even higher, 16.5%. But the, benefit, the utilization rate drops to 86.2%, and 6.9 million worth of goods entered under no preference claim. In other words, they, they paid the 16 and percent duty. And I guess my question is why is that the case? Why is it that utilization falls when the tariff rate rose? So the question is what ex to what extent do preferences affect exports? So if you look at the uh, total US imports under 6107.99, it's 165 million US dollars. And the top five exporting countries to the United States account for uh, about 89.8%. Only the exporter in fifth place receives preferences. In other words, the leading exporters to the United States are paying that 14.5% duty. 
and AGOA, our African preferences account for less than 1% of total US imports. Why is it the case that preference beneficiaries are not able to take advantage of the preferences that they receive? If you look at subheading 610910, total US imports 5.1 billion. Of the top 10 countries that export to the United States, five are FTA partners. And the first unilateral trade preference beneficiary is number 13. Eight of the top 20 exporters receive some sort of trade preference, such as the FTA trade preferences, but not the third country fabric allowance. In other words, they must use fabric that originates in one of the FTA parties. Unilateral beneficiaries account for only 4.4% of US imports. Again, the duty on these goods is about 16%. Why is it that unilateral trade preference beneficiaries are unable to take advantage of that tariff benefit? I wanna draw a distinction here between rules of origin that the United States applies. The rules of origin that are applied under our preference programs are based on the regional value content, as I stated. However, the rules of origin in US free trade agreements can vary and uh, often do utilize a tariff shift uh, method. The, U the rules of origin under our preference program are contained in US law, whereas the rules of origin in our free trade agreements are negotiated between the United States and the other party. And they can be modified administratively in order to account for changes to the harmonized system that occur every five years or changes in domestic uh, sourcing patterns. So for instance, if the rule of origin was written a certain way and sourcing patterns have changed over time, it is possible to modify the rule in US free trade agreements administratively and not through a change in legislation. I would highlight for you uh, a, a publication from the US International Trade Commission. You can see the number there and you can easily uh, enter that into their website and pull up this document. But it looked at what are the factors that affect the utilization of preferences? And here they're elaborated. Eligibility, the presence of uh, foreign direct investment, demand in the United States and such. But again, it takes me back to the example we highlighted before, where we saw goods with fairly high MFN tariff rates in the United States. And we see unilateral trade preference recipients not being able to take advantage uh, of the benefits. So again, my last slide is here some, poses some questions uh, that you may wish to consider. What factors affect the utilization of trade preferences? Why do they swing so dramatically uh, from year to year when you would expect that established players in that industry would have knowledge of them? Why do they swing from two to 20% utilization? Why is utilization affected even for goods that are wholly obtained, that are easy, to prove the origin for agricultural products, minerals that are extracted from the earth. These are fairly easy to show uh, their originating status. And yet we don't see full utilization of the preferences. Why is that? And finally, what is the relationship between a country's MFN tariff rate and preference utilizations? Do higher tariff rates create more of an incentive for preference utilization? What is the connection between tariffs and utilization of preferences? So thank you for, for your attention. Thank you, Kent, uh, for your presentation that gave an excellent overview of the various US preference schemes and also how these schemes are used uh, across different origins and across different uh, sectors. We will come back to your questions also in your last slide towards the end of today's webinar. And uh, I'd like to remind participants to use the Q&A function in the meantime to ask more questions. We see already that several came in, so we're very grateful for this. Our next speaker today is uh, 
Madam Özlem Taitas Öztürk from Turkey. And Özlem is a senior trade expert and experienced FDA negotiator in the Directorate uh, General of International Agreements and EU Affairs of the Ministry of Trade. Özlem, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, actually, uh, it was a very informative presentation by the US, so thank you very much, Kent. Uh, today, I will briefly give information about our um, experience on the analysis of preference utilization. Uh, actually, uh, Turkey's FTAs and PTAs uh, are very wide, but um, analyzing uh, the rates of preference utilization are quite new uh, to us, although uh, this network is very wide. Today, I will try to briefly uh, inform you about our experience. This is the plan of my presentation, and I will start with our uh, FTAs and PTAs, uh, and then I will continue with the analysis of preference utilization. Uh, Turkey has 22 FTAs in force uh, and four FTAs are pending for ratification. Uh, the latest one is with Ukraine and we are still uh, waiting the situation improves in Ukraine um, in order to be able to put it into force. We also have uh, a couple of preferential trade agreements as you can see on the screen. Uh, the two uh, with Iran and Azerbaijan are in force and the last one with Uzbekistan uh, is about to be completed. I just wanted to remind you um, one issue. Our preferential trade agreements are less comprehensive compared to our free trade agreements. They include um, a couple of products. Uh, uh, when we compare it with free trade agreements, they, their coverage is really um, simple. So uh, when we look at our FTAs and PTAs under negotiation, there are three active ones uh, for FTAs, Japan, Thailand, and Indonesia. And there are three active ones for PTAs with Pakistan, Mozambique, and Mauritania. There are also other 10 countries that we, we uh, would like to conclude our negotiations uh, in the upcoming future. Uh, if you look at our foreign trade uh, with FTA partners, we, we see a steady rise in the exports and imports. Uh, exports are around 40 billion US dollars in 2021, and imports are around um, 30 billion US dollars. This is for 2021. When we come to the main issue of this presentation, this is the customs declaration document where we collect data regarding preference utilization. Uh, in this document, you can see there's a box uh, number 36 and the importers can uh, include their preferential uh, treatment and the name of the country on this box. Uh, it is stated here as South Korea. Um, so this raw data is collected from our uh, customs and the Minister of Trade and then obviously a pro in or, uh, needs to be processed in order to reach a meaningful conclusion for uh, analyzing the utilization rates. Um, this box is also uh, relevant for our preferential regimes with PTAs uh, and LDCs as well. But I just wanted to mention one thing as well. Um, this data and the aggregated data at the end um, is not publicly available. This is just for internal use right now. And as I mentioned previously, this type of analysis is quite new for Turkey. Uh, we only have two cases. This, the first one is with Switzerland and the second one is with EFTA countries in total. For Switzerland, uh, this uh, analysis is conducted for the years 2016 and 2019. And we find that the utilization rates of Switzerland is ranging between 16 to 42%. The second one is with uh, EFTA countries, and uh, this is also conducted for the years uh, 2018 and 2020. And the result, the rates are ranging between 14 to 30% in total. EFTA also shared data, their data, and we found similar rates for, for Turkey's utilization of this FTA. They were around 30% uh, between 2018 and 2020. Uh, there's one issue that I would like to remind you, Turkey FTA, FTA is our first FTA, and as far as I know, this is the case, uh, uh, this is also the case for EFTA as well, Turkey is their first FTA partner. Even though this is the case, um, the utilization rates are considerably low, 
so we consider that this situation is not so uh, relevant about unawareness of companies or exporters. Uh, there must be other reasons as well. In my presentation, I will focus more on the other reasons. I mean, um, the first one, uh, low MFR rates in industrial products. Uh, as a party to the customs union, Turkey is in line with the EU's common commercial policy and common customs tariff. That's why our, our uh, MFR rates are quite low compared to other countries. Uh, this may be one reason. So um, this may discourage exporters to use preferential regime and deal with the paperwork to be comp completed uh, in the case of preferential uh, treatment. The second reason may be small differences between MFN rates and preferential rates. This is also the case for industrial products. Uh, preferential rates and MFN, are, and MFN rates are uh, quite similar. And just for the case of Turkey FTA, FTA uh, we think fluctuation of trade in commodities, especially trade in gold, uh, is really important. Um, when there is a rise in gold imports from EFTA, this, is autom this automatically results in a decline in utilization rates of FTA. Um, this is because both MFN rates and preferential rates are zero for uh, gold. I just would like to remind you that. And the last one, role of origin requirements, customs procedures. Actually, it is a bit a question mark to us right now. Uh, as I, uh, I said, Turkey is a party to the customs union with the EU in accordance with the decision uh, 195. And uh, because of this, Turkey is in line with the EU's origin requirements. Uh, and these requirements don't differ from the EU's in any of its PTAs or FTAs or other uh, preferential regimes. So uh, it is not so much easy for Turkey to... Um, Modif to make modifications in rules of origin requirements and other uh, procedures uh, uh, according to the results of this type of analysis of preference utilization. Uh, according to the studies on the possible effects of rules of origin on the utilization of preferences, yes, we believe these rules might be associated with administrative burden, but this relation has not been improved for our FTAs with a comprehensive study yet. Uh, this is a new area, so uh, we would like to uh, study more on the effects uh, of this, these rules on our FTAs. Uh, but I just uh, would like to um, inform you about uh, NIFS, our NIF system to facilitate customs procedures, which is called MEDOS, Automation System for Certificates of Origin and Movement Certificates. Uh, it is developed for the issuance and endorsement of the moment certificates by Turkish customs offices electronically. And these certificates um, mirror a unique and unreproducible QR code so that the accuracy and uh, authenticity of the documents can be easily verified by the importing customs authority. Uh, we expect that the implementation of this system will encourage the use of the preferences provided by the FTAs. Uh, and also, uh, we, we plan to raise the awareness of our exporters uh, and traders uh, more about our FTAs and PTAs, and also the benefits of using the uh, preferential rules of origin and preferential tariff rates as well. Uh, we would like to uh, hold more uh, training programs or um, seminars uh, about these issues in the upcoming features as well, as we always do. And the final part of my presentation is about our um, legally binding provisions uh, on preference utilization. Uh, we have two free trade agreements that we include data sharing on preference utilization as an article. And the first one is with the UK and the second one is with Ukraine. Of course, it is, with, it is in ratification process. Uh, but even though we don't uh, include such kind of provisions on our FTAs as we did with Turkey uh, under Turkey FTA, FTA we, uh, we are open to share our data and we also would like to improve our experience, improve our work on this matter as well. Thank you very much for listening and thank you very much for your attention. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you, Aslim, for your very interesting presentation. And uh, I found it particularly fascinating to hear about the variability of utilization within a given scheme and also to hear about uh, your data sharing experience. 
We're now hearing from the perspective of the European Free Trade Association, EFTA Secretariat. EFTA is an intergovernmental organization of Iceland, Liechtenstein, Norway, and Switzerland. Our speakers today with us here are Mr. Bruno Hasek and Mr. Simon Wittrich Bovet. Bruno Hasek is an expert in trading goods and FTA negotiations, and previously also was part of the Swiss delegation to the World Trade Organization. Simon Wittrich Bovet is a specialist in investment and trade and services in the context of FTA negotiations. Bruno, Simon, you have the floor. Um, thank you very much, uh, Simon, and hello, everyone. Um, also, thank you to the speakers before and, and also to, to see um, Özlem. As you can guess, we had the previous exchange with Turkey indeed in this question. Um, so first, allow me to, to introduce um, a bit uh, our organization. I mean, we are EFTA. Uh, transition works. Perfect. Uh, as you mentioned, we are indeed an intergovernmental organization uh, working on economic cooperation. Uh, while our members uh, do not have a common free trade policy, we do in fact negotiate uh, free trade agreements uh, together. As a result, we have an extensive network of free trades. Uh, of course, free trade agreements are not the only uh, preferential trade agreements that we have, but we have more than 29 of them with 40 partner countries. So as a result, um, and we are now having uh, free trade agreements for, uh, for several decades, but we did not yet have any data on, on actually the effective use of the agreement and their efficiency. So this is part of, uh, of a project that we are developing, which is called the EFTA FTA monitor. And the goal is indeed to actually um, have information on the use of these agreements um, and also to, in a, in a longer term, to make it public. So maybe I will just um, summarize a bit before coming to the results, uh, a bit the process and uh, share our experience on how we actually came to, to such project. Um, originally, um, it was actually one of our member states, Switzerland, who was mandated to do a study on the use of their free trade agreements. Um, and, and there um, they actually had interesting results that they have published in 2020 and it was decided to expand it to all of the states. So what is the FTA monitor? Basically, it's an analysis that is quantitative on the effective use of FTAs. What we aim to do is to answer three questions. The first one is to know actually to what extent companies make use of FTAs, and also what is the amount of tariff savings achieved as a result. I mean, we always speak about the value of, of FTAs and of, of tariff savings, but here we actually would like to see what is the actual um, results. The second one is to understand whether um, there is a differentiation between imports and exports. I mean, trade agreements are aimed to be mutually beneficial. This is something that we would like to look at. And finally, we also would like to see if there is any variation uh, in, in the use of, of free trade agreements across partners over time, across sectors and for the groups. And I think we already have already heard that uh, it can actually vary a lot. Um, regarding the coverage of this study, uh, it covers all our agreements on the import side, and this because actually we use uh, EFTA data uh, to, to, to actually uh, receive that information, and then 14 um, uh, free trade agreements on the export side, and I'll come back to that because in fact, if you want to know the use of the preference um, from, from a product, we actually have to have the custom information from the country that is importing the data. Uh, so we basically have to request our partner countries to provide this information. And here uh, we actually have responses already on 14 of them, which is very positive, and we are working towards having actually more uh, information. So a bit uh, background on how we did it. So basically it was first um, a Swiss university who set up the, the framework and the, and the methodology for the for the, for the study, um, we basically took over from it. Um, it is based on a simple formula and it is not rocket science. It is basically the same one that was presented by the WTO Secretariat. It's basically um, comparing the, the actual use of preferences compared to the potential of, of preferences. And uh, the analysis was actually made in a relatively short time frame, uh, basically in, uh, in less than six months. So the first step was to actually agree on, on what data should be exchanged. 
so basically just the determinants of, of data and, and it was agreed that we should have um, import tariffs uh, in value in volumes over three years uh, and that we should provide the, the type of preference that is used, whether it was imported under a preferential regime or an MFN regime, for example, or another regime such as GSP. Um, and then of course the tariff information. Then we proceeded to data exchanges. Uh, I mean, this is basically sending emails to FTA partners, asking them whether they would like to collaborate on this. And here, um, I'm glad to see two panelists who actually we have collaborated with already, uh, namely Canada and, and Turkey uh, being there. And here I have to say it was a very positive experience. Um, although of course, not every country were able to yet provide data, but, uh, but it is ongoing work. Um, then we have uh, actually analyzed the data, and that was uh, basically from November to, to, to January. Um, this was made with a publicly available uh, software, um, and uh, my colleague, in fact, Simon, uh, has done that. Uh, and then now we actually have finished the study. Uh, we are not working towards publication of it, uh, and it's uh, ongoing in, the, in, 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 the, in member states, whether they, they will actually... Um, provide this information public and we hope to publish the results very soon um, and now I think I will give the floor to my colleague Simon who will give actually uh, information on, on, on our findings and some early uh, views on the output many thanks uh, Bruno um, in what follows I will uh, briefly showcase the the key features of our FTA monitor and then in a subsequent step also summarize the few first observations we have managed to glean uh, from the data uh, we currently um, have. With regards to the output, I would like to use an, an illustrative uh, case um, to make this a bit more uh, tangible. Uh, we're looking here at exports from um, EFTA to the Republic um, of Korea. As stated by Bruno, we also consistently have the data on our import site and also scope for disaggregating the data at the level of individual EFTA, uh, of the individual EFTA member states. Now, uh, in the top section of the monitor, we provide general information uh, on uh, the bilateral trade uh, in question. Certainly value-wise, importantly, we also provide information on the share of exports, in this case, which were affected duty-free, not only under uh, the FTA in question, but also um, MFN, since, as we have heard, um, um, duty-free trade under MFN can also um, constitute a sizable share of, of, of trade relations. On the import side, we have additionally managed to get data on duty-free trade under other preferential schemes, and uh, you would see this uh, also appear in our in our monitor. Um, at the top section, we directly also provide information on the preference utilization rates, which has been like, which have been calculated based on the formula set out by uh, Bruno and, and Darlan as well. Um, on to the limitations. Um, here we have made, first and foremost, a very conscious um, a choice to exclude gold uh, from our analysis because we think that there's a lot of volatility when it comes especially to the price uh, of gold in international trade and that this would uh, unduly distort our, our findings on preference utilization rates. Moreover, and here we were forced to exclude uh, these, uh, these elements, uh, we have so far not been able to account for um, trade under uh, tariff rate uh, quotas. Uh, trade related uh, to, to variable to tariffs and X outs um, as well. Uh, we uh, continue our internal discussions uh, into potential ways also to account for this in, in, in our um, analytical framework. Moving on to, to the graphs, uh, I would like to highlight a few features here. In the top left section, you can see that we provide information on the decomposition of trade into the different uh, categories. Uh, FTA, MFN, and other preferential schemes. For certain partners, we have observed that uh, trade under other preferential schemes can be very um, uh, sizable. Um, and then that our analysis on, on preference utilization rates, in fact, uh, is limited to a, a minor share of, of, of total trade. So it's very important always to keep this uh, in mind when, when discussing uh, PURs, preference utilization rates. Uh, in the top right um, section, we have made an attempt at uh, providing information on uh, so-called ad valorem equivalent, so uh, the percentage um, duties that are applied on all traded products for products where uh, we had a compound duty, so a mix of uh, percentage and specific duties or specific duties only. We have applied the transformation to get at these ad valorem equivalents and then map out uh, trade uh, in a hypothetical scenario where everything takes place under MFN. 
another scenario where everything takes place under the FTA quest in question, and then the blue line in the middle uh, trade as it occurs in, in the real world. Turning to the, the lower section of, of, of the output, um, we have also managed to retrieve uh, data or to calculate basically uh, the uh, duties that have been effectively paid by economic uh, operators. And from this, we have been able to infer uh, the um, untapped savings potential uh, related to um, each FTA in question. Mm -hmm. What we have observed here is that for partners with which a trade exceeds a certain critical uh, threshold, that these rates um, are fairly stable. Um, over time, of course, there's still some variation, but there's uh, quite some stability in there. And the same actually also applies to, uh, to the preference utilization rates. Now, that being said, our analysis so far is restricted to three years. So we have not yet been able, of course, to account for any learning uh, by doing or learning over time uh, dynamics, if there are any um, in, in this data. Finally, uh, we also um, have zeroed in on the uh, individual product groups and products in question. Uh, we look at the top 10 uh, uh, product groups which are traded in, in this bilateral um, setting and then output the uh, individual PURs and also the saving rates and uh, the savings in terms of US dollars. Uh, furthermore, and I think this is a, a key feature also of our monitor, we output the top 10 products uh, with the highest untapped um, savings, tariff savings. Uh, we do so at HS6 level to allow interested readers and economic operators to really pin down these products. The descriptions you see on, on this slide are at HS2, but what we've included are dynamic hyperlinks to the website of the World Customs Organization so that you can immediately identify the product in question. I'll pick an example since we're in Switzerland. Let's use the one of, of watches, uh, 910221. Um, if you click here, you would see that we are talking about uh, wrist uh, watches and, and pocket watches with an automatic winding, just for, for illustrative um, purposes. Uh, we've also started discussions internally to see whether there's any scope for linking our monitor up uh, to uh, general um, databases on preferential uh, rules of origin. Uh, the WTO Secretariat has already referred to the database uh, by the ITC, the Rules of Origin Facilitator database. We've started discussions in this regard and there might be some scope for, for linking up um, our monitor with, with the relevant uh, database. So. What have we observed um, so far uh, based on our, on our data and, and analysis? Um, uh, interestingly, in our data, uh, we, uh, and this applies across the board, so to, to, to all partners, um, we have observed no clear-cut relationship between the PUR on the one hand and the uh, preferential margin on the other hand. As a reminder, the preferential margin is the difference in percentage points between the applicable MFN rate and the rate under an FTA. This finding was surprising to us uh, in the first instance, but then we thought that there are, of course, a lot of additional intervening factors, such as uh, rules of origin or, or the fragmentation of value chains, which can basically explain uh, the patterns we have in the data. What we have seen, nonetheless, is that there appears to be quite a neat positive relationship or correlation between the PUR and the total, um, total savings um, or the total savings potential linked to an FTA. But differently, the more you can save by using an FTA in US dollar terms, the more likely you are uh, to make use um, of, of, of the preferences enshrined in such treaty. Finally, and this was already alluded to by Bruno, there's a lot of variation uh, we, we see both across and within regions, so that do not appear to be regional fixed effects in our data, uh, and this also applies to the product groups. Of course, our first descriptive analyses are embedded in, in a broader uh, field of research on, on determinants of, of PURs. Um, I have just... Um, picked out a, a few uh, recent examples uh, here, which are, in our view, fairly interesting. Uh, researchers um, using data from Switzerland have found that there does not seem to be a penalty um, for small and medium-sized enterprises when it comes to uh, using um, preferences. They are as well positioned as multinational corporations to make use um, of, um, of, of tariff preferences. What seems to be a key driving force, rather, um, is the time spent active in trade. So there appears to be a 
quite a strong dynamic by based on the learning by, by doing a process. Uh, and this has been found, found in a study, I think, conducted by the National Board of Trade of Sweden. Uh, transaction size also seems to matter, and I think this links back to our findings on, on total savings potential linked to an FTA. What is clear for us, at least at, at EFTA, is that there's definitely need for more in-depth analysis uh, to then pave the way for, for targeted policy measures to improve a preference utilization. Uh, we see a scope for both quantitative and qualitative analysis, and when it comes to the latter, we'll certainly um, seek to engage with our partners, which um, have provided us with data, and then ideally also, of course, uh, the, the economic operators um, themselves. The key takeaways for us are, are, are as follows with regard to the process. It is crystal clear that uh, data is key and that the conditio sine qua non for any analysis uh, on, on PURs. Uh, we have made very positive experiences um, engaging with our uh, partner countries and um, take note that basically both sides can prefer, uh, can benefit from, from such data exchanges because at the end of the day, you always have two parties which are involved in, in, in a given transaction in international trade. Also, um, uh, based on the experience for the specific case of Switzerland, we think that uh, academia can provide a very uh, valuable uh, support um, in this regard, especially when it comes to the setup of a, an analytical framework at, at an early stage of, of the process. With regard to the output, we see that there's overall a fairly good use uh, that has been made of, of preferences enshrined in, in our FTAs, but significant variation can be observed among countries and, and product groups. There are certainly data limitations, the one I, I, I briefly summarized, which do not yet allow us to obtain a full picture, but we have made a, a useful first step. Moving forward, we'll certainly uh, continue and deepen our um, exchanges with partner countries and the business sectors to really understand the root causes of, of preference utilization. And finally, to conclude, and I think this links back also to the debate about uh, GSP and other unilateral preferential uh, schemes, our analysis has also provided us with uh, invaluable insights into the use or at least the, the relative importance um, of such um, arrangements. And with this, I would like to uh, conclude and we look forward uh, to an interesting discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Bruno and Simon for this very insightful and detailed presentation. And uh, we also see that a lot of work and thought went into your analysis and we look forward to discuss some of your takeaways uh, later on in the session, uh, in particular, how to uh, address some of the bottlenecks that you mentioned. Um, our next speaker is uh, Madam Ingrid Garrido. Ingrid is an uh, economic advisor at the Market Access Division of the Under Secretariat of International Economic Relations of Chile. So good morning to you. She has been involved in several negotiations of regional trade agreements and has monitored market access issues in the framework of FTAs and multilateral fora, including the WTO and APEC. Ingrid, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. Uh, I will share my presentation. Well, I will introduce myself. I am Ingrid Garrido from the Market Access Division of Sucre, and I'm going to speak uh, today about the monitoring of the utilization of our trade agreements with different partners. Uh, this will be the contents of my presentation. First, I will uh, make a little introduction. Then I will talk to you about the experience, the results, and finally, uh, we uh, will take some takes away. Uh, first, in the experience of Chile, uh, we have some uh, incentives uh, since a couple or since a few years ago. Uh, given that uh, Chile has a huge uh, net of trade agreements, uh, we have 31 trade agreements with 65 economies. So uh, the main incentive here is to evaluate the effectiveness of our uh, trade agreements. As Darla mentioned, the utilization uh, data will provide us uh, a sign of the 
uh, effectiveness of the trade agreements. Uh, then uh, it was interesting for us to, to make these evaluations because uh, uh, when you uh, come with the uh, relevant data, you can make evaluations by sector or geographically. And this is very interesting because it crossed a lot with the evaluation of uh, tariff provisions, uh, non-tariff measures, or even our rules of origins. And then our next incentive uh, was finding uh, the spaces of to improve our, our uh, current trade agreements or uh, take uh, data driven decisions in the negotiation of new trade agreements. Uh, we have the experience with India, a uh, country uh, with which uh, exchanged uh, trade utilization trade statistics uh, before the joint administrative committee of 2019. And in that, uh, in that exchange of information, uh, we make the evaluations. And I think that the results of that evaluation was key for the launch of a new modernization negotiation of the agreement. So this is very important to have this kind of statistics to take to make uh, data driven decisions. And finally, with the entry into force of the protocol of the Pacific Alliance uh, in 2016. We have the question of uh, how, uh, how what, what was the share of our imports using the bilateral, uh, the previous bilateral agreements with our trade partners in the Pacific Alliance uh, versus the utilization, uh, the effective utilization of the trade protocol of the Pacific Alliance. The main indicators here are the percentage of uh, the trade of imports using trade agreements, uh, the percentage in the total bilateral imports or uh, in the eligible imports. And another a very important indicator for us is the trade weighted average rate. Uh, we account with import information from our customs uh, national service, national customs service. And actually I will, uh, I will give you here uh, the link uh, to a dashboard when, uh, from which you can obtain uh, utilization data very quickly. Um, from exports, uh, we accounted with a publicly available databases. Uh, for example, in the case of United States, uh, we can download the, the, directly the information from the USITC. But with another trade partners, we wanted to make the exercise of the evaluation of the trade agreement. And we needed to make exchanges of uh, trade information, of import information. It, it was the exercise uh, carried out with uh, India, EFTA countries, Canada, uh, countries of the Pacific Alliance, and, and it has been very fruitful. And in the case of uh, tariff databases, it's similar to export databases. We account with uh, publicly available information, but we, uh, we have obtained information directly from our trade partners. Um, here, I wanted to show you the uh, percentage or the share of imports using a trade agreement in the total bilateral uh, uh, imports from some specific country. And it is very interesting that uh, countries with a long, a long history um, mainly in Latin America. Here we can see Colombia, Peru, and Mexico. We have a huge share of in bilateral imports using the old uh, trade agreements with which we account with our trade partners. And another finding here is that the utilization of the trade agreements are very relevant the year uh, 
the following year after the entry into force of an agreement. For example, in the case of China, in the case of Japan, we see that a relevant share of the bilateral imports are using the FTA after the year after the entry into force of our agreements. Uh, but here we have another measure that is the underutilization rates uh, explained in the presentation of Darlan, excluding uh, products that are not eligible for um, preferential treatment and um, excluding products with an MFN rate equivalent to zero. And well, here we have uh, two graphs because the amounts uh, with uh, the European Union, United States, China, and Mercosur are much higher than the import volume from other countries with trade agreements. But we see in the, in the graph of the um, left that the, the underutilization of agreements it varies across countries. We see EFTA countries uh, with high uh, levels of underutilization, but another trade agreements with a, a high level of utilization as Peru, uh, Colombia, Canada. Um, a finding here, I, I think, well, of course, the here the relevant figure is the underutilization rate uh, but here when we compare the the underutilization rate among different countries we see that uh, it is um, it seems that when the total amount imported from a trade partner is higher you have uh, more incentives to climb uh, tariff preferences. Uh, this, uh, this gives us a sign of that more incentives to use FTAs uh, happens when uh, the total savings are higher. Um, another indicator relevant for Chile is the trade weighted tariff rate. Um, why? Because Chile has an MFN rate uh, of 6% for almost all products since 2003. So the gap between the, uh, the average rate, the trade weighted average rate and the 6% will give us a picture of the benefits given by our trade agreements. And here we can make the comparison uh, with from India, um, between India, that is a preferential trade agreement covering a low part uh, of tariff lines and giving uh, preferences not necessarily of a uh, discount of the whole MFN rate. It could be a margin of preference of 50%, 80%. And the result of the, of the effective tariff pay, uh, paid here in Chile is, is, is very different between the India and other agreements, uh, which savings are higher. Um, the result, of course, has been a tariff rate um, lower than 1% uh, since more than 10 years in Chile in the whole picture of total imports. Um, here, I wanted to show you uh, the, this data that we exchanged with India because uh, this is uh, import uh, Indian imports from Chile. So it, it's relevant information from our exports. And we note here that the, the, our exports are highly concentrated in products with a low MFN rate uh, of 5%. 
and climbing uh, the preferences, the preference of uh, discount of uh, 100%, uh, meaning a preferential tariff of 0%. But in the trade of products with higher MFN tariffs are very much lower. But here we have a new, uh, you, here we have again, the same the same sign uh, that the imports are facing an MFM rate of ten percent that could climb a tariff preference uh, different than a zero percent preferential tariff are not climbing as for example products uh, facing an MFM rate of thirty percent and with the possibility of save the um, half of that amount, that means a discount of 50%. And something that we note here is that, well, the scheme of the MFN tariff in India is uh, higher tariffs for the, for the um, agricultural and fisheries sector and lower MFN tariffs from the industrial sector. And it is important to note that in these sectors, um, for example, products are facing an MFN rate of 7.5% or 10% are not using the, um, are not using the, um, the tariff preferences of the agreements uh, entirely. And our findings with another trade partners are similar. We know that with each, uh, each agreement, we have an amount that do not use. So it doesn't use the tariff preference. Here we have the cases of EFTA countries in Canada, countries with, with we exchange tariff uh, uh, trade statistics, and the case of United States uh, download from the USITC. And we see that the share of imports uh, not using uh, the tariff, the trade agreements but uh, which could use is very low. Nonetheless, the underutilization rate in the case of EFTA countries, when with, with, with you have lower uh, volumes of trade and you have um, longer, uh, longer lists of excluded products are uh, much higher than, for example, United States, the country with which we have a feature agreement covering all the uh, products and with huge um, uh, volumes of trade. Uh, our conclusions are basically uh, that uh, the National Customs Service of Chile provides uh, the trade weight average um, tariff uh, since a lot of years ago. So we have uh, this historical data. And then Supre um, in the last years uh, have uh, additionally uh, calculated underutilization rates or utilization rates uh, with export databases or well, import databases from our trade partners. Um, in the case of Chile, the gap between the import weighted average and the MFN rate of 6% is a direct indicator of the effectiveness of the FDA. And as I mentioned, it is uh, less than 1% uh, since more than 10 years ago. Uh, 
we note that there is a need to standardize and formalize the exchange of trade data. That is an exercise that we have carried with uh, EFTA countries and Canada with, um, with modalities, with a template, and to improve the information that we are exchanging. Um, we have uh, here some initiatives uh, to evaluate the utilization of tariff preferences in the framework of the Pacific Alliance, because uh, the Pacific Alliance, you have another provisions, for example, cumulative origin, and uh, the overlapping with other trade agreements. Um, I think uh, that we it would be interesting uh, to compare uh, the trade statistics of for example, one product with two different agreements, but uh, with different uh, rules of origins or other provisions to evaluate the impact of that provisions. Um, in Chile, the underutilization of, um, of uh, trade agreements is mainly related to um, avoiding the, oh, I'm sorry, the utilization of trade agreements are mainly related to obtain savings in the payment of custom tariffs. Um, it means that uh, the tariff reduction, the concession of a tariff reduction in an FTA different that a preferential tariff rate of 0% is not as relevant as the liberalization of that product. Um, this kind of data uh, give us signs of the, of the reasons of, uh, of trade operators to use or not use the free trade agreements or other trade agreements. Um, for example, in the fears that we have obtained from trade partners, we know we have noted that uh, the underutilization is uh, very concentrated in agroindustrial or industrial goods because the saving on MFN rate is low, or maybe because of the characteristic of the goods, good is harder to obtain a certificate of origin. Um, then uh, we see that in the agricultural sector, um, uh, where the totally obtained rule of origin is more common, uh, it of course discouraged the utilization of FTAs. But in the case of Chile, that underutilization is not significant and is not as relevant as the underutilization in the agroindustrial and industrial sector. And finally, we uh, always are asking if uh, we are efficient to spread the benefits of our uh, free trade agreements among the uh, citizens. And as SUPREI and other um, governmental organizations including customs, uh, the Ministry of Agriculture, and the Ministry of Economy are involved in a lot of activities, uh, in a lot of uh, roundtable seminars, workshop to spread the benefits of the trade agreements. But this, I think this is not a very relevant factor because we see that in the, if a trade agreement enter into force in one year, the next year is highly utilized. Um, and finally, uh, a next step is focusing efforts on new industries with the lowest uh, FTA utilization rates. Uh, we need to obtain more information and make more analysis and make sectoral analysis. Um, mainly in the case of uh, rules of origin studies. Thank you. 
Thank you, Ingrid, for this uh, great presentation and all the details you gave uh, in respect of preference utilization of Chile, of Chile. I found particularly interesting to see how preference utilization also changed over time. Our final speaker for today is Mr. David Flasblum. David Flasblum is a trade policy officer at Global Affairs Canada. We look forward uh, to your presentation, David. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, I'm just going to pull this up. Uh, thank you. My name is David Lusblum. I work in the Tariffs and Goods Market Access Division of Global Affairs Canada. Today, I will outline Canada's free trade agreement preference utilization analysis project, including our methodology, our data collection work, and uh, some of our early results of analysis. So why do we study preference utilization rates? Preference, preference utilization data collection and analysis helps us to understand how our FTAs are performing. And in the past, uh, prior to using uh, preference utilization, uh, we mainly looked at changes in trade values over time to assess the performance of our FTAs. And this isn't really optimal because it's hard to separate out the impacts of preference under FTAs from other factors that are at work uh, influencing trade flows. And also this becomes even worse as you try to look at less aggregated data, such as a subheading, uh, HS subheading, for example. Uh, preference utilization rates, on the other hand, are, uh, are an indicator at even the most micro level of how, uh, to what extent traders are using the FTA. They're making a choice to use the FTA, um, and it is uh, possible, therefore, to uh, bring together uh, all of this data from different places, uh, from different FTA partners, and uh, get a clear picture of, of some of the factors that would be influencing uh, utilization. Now, I will briefly address the methodology Canada uses to calculate preference utilization. Uh, the core concept is the preference utilization rate. And uh, as uh, some of the other presenters have already described, uh, Canada's method of calculating this is very similar. It is the uh, the denominator that we use is the potential uh, preferential trade. And then um, this is limited to trade that would have been subject to tariffs absent the preference granted under the FTA. And then the, the PUR uh, numerator is the uh, trades in goods that actually uh, received the FTA preference. Uh, Canada excludes several categories of trade from the PUR denominator. Uh, this is a, a chart that shows uh, which uh, goods are not counted in the PUR denominator. Um, specifically, we, we don't even include uh, chapters uh, 98 and 99 in data exchanges at all. And then uh, additionally, there are a number of goods that are not counted because either the, there's no uh, marginal rate of preference between the MFN and the, uh, the FTA preference. And then uh, there are also goods that are imported under different preferential schemes other than the FTA, and we don't count those either. Uh, the next concept is the marginal preferential tariff rate or the marginal rate of preference. This is the difference between the MFN rate and the FDA preferential tariff rate. In the case uh, where uh, there is no uh, preferential tariff rates, uh, where it's duty free, then it's the same as the MFN rate. Uh, normally, we calculate this rate in terms of value, but in the case of quantity specific tariff rates, it is also possible to calculate on the basis of quantity. And it is possible also to aggregate MPTR across many data points by waiting for trade. And finally, there is the marginal tariff value. <clears throat> this is uh, simply the marginal preference rate multiplied by the trade value. 
That means, for example, that a million dollars of trade that are subject to a 5% marginal preference rate have a marginal tariff value of $50,000. Uh, that, that's just uh, an indication of the potential uh, benefit that could be achieved under the FTA. Uh, so that's an, a measure of the money that traders could be saving by using the FTA. So next, what are the factors impacting preference utilization rates? The two most obvious factors and the ones that are easiest to measure with our PUR data are the trade value and the marginal tariff preference. The tariff lines with the larger trade value tend to have higher uh, preference rates and the theory is that traders are more inclined to use the FTA for higher value transactions. Uh, so as it's probably linked to the transaction rather than the actual amount of trade on the line, uh, we do want to look at the least aggregated data possible uh, because it does get us closer to that individual transaction level. Uh, regarding the marginal preference rates, much has already been said in the literature about the weak role that they seem to play in explaining preference utilization. And this has also been our finding. Um, our analysis shows that it, there's a weaker link than there is with the trade value. And then finally, Canada has found that combining trade value and marginal preference into a single measure of marginal trade value does offer a slightly more predictive metric than just looking at trade value on its own, uh, but we have been using both of these. And uh, so yes, our, our uh, quantitative, quantitative analysis to date has mostly focused on these measures that I presented here. Uh, but the literature also points to a number of other factors that likely contribute to the variation we see in utilization rates and uh, of those rules of origin is uh, likely a very large factor. We know that compliance with rules of origin carries with it a certain administrative burden, which may contribute to the observed correlations between trade value and utilization rates. Uh, it, you know, if traders don't think that compliance is worth it for lower value shipments, uh, the compliance burden for rules of origin may also be higher in cases where traders are unfamiliar with certain provisions or procedures in an FTA, let's say it's a new FTA um, or it's an FTA that they don't uh, regularly use. And this might help to explain the differences we see in utilization rates between FTAs also. And of course, rules of origin are designed to exclude goods from preference if they don't meet the definition of an originating good. So, uh, you know, the, the goal, uh, in an FTA is not 100% utilization, of course, it is 100% uh, utilization of goods that meet the rule of origin. Uh, but this is a challenge in terms of doing quantitative analysis. Given that we suspect rules of origin are a large factor impacting preference utilization, we are looking at ways to incorporate them into the PUR project. Uh, but this is difficult to do. We haven't uh, done enough work to really uh, get there yet. Uh, developing a standardized approach is a challenge because the rules of origin uh, have impacts that are situational, uh, difficult to uh, compare across products or across regions. And certainly they're, uh, they're harder to measure than the impacts of tariffs. So in Canada, preference utilization data is collected by the Canada Border Services Agency. It's managed by Statistics Canada and Finance Canada. And in Canada, we do not make uh, the PUR data publicly available. Canada collects data for both free trade agreements and unilateral preference schemes. Uh, but this analysis is only studying the free trade agreements preference data. In addition to collecting raw utilization data, Canada is currently working on developing a survey of Canadian producers and exporters, and this will help us to better understand uh, their challenges in using FTA preference. With regard to international data sharing, for several years now, Canada has been active in organizing uh, preference utilization data exchanges with our FTA partners. To date, we have obtained data from a total of 41 countries across seven of Canada's 14 FTAs, including uh, most of our largest agreements. 
And uh, that would, will also uh, hopefully increase to eight FTAs later this month. Uh, we have a data exchange uh, uh, that is pending. And our exchanges normally include both value and quantity data. We, uh, we need to get data at the tariff level so we can get uh, an exact uh, rate of preference for that trade. Um, and then also we exchange MFN and preferential tariff rates for each year. And we try to exchange uh, tariff line concordances as well. Uh, this is something that we're still working on integrating into our database, uh, but it does allow us to compare data between years. And finally, our analytical products. Our preference utilization rate database is growing fast and now it includes millions of data points. And in order to access and analyze all of this data, we have developed a relational database. Currently, we are using Power Pivot and Excel as our platform to operate the database, but there are limitations with it. It does work very well with Excel, which is a bonus for us. Uh, but we are looking at potentially migrating to a more robust platform in the future. Our database is versatile and it allows us to quickly perform customized data extractions and comparative analysis of trade values, preference utilization rates, uh, the marginal preferential tariffs uh, and the marginal tariff values. Uh, at all levels of aggregation across our FTAs and time, and it allows for exchange rate conversions. We're also, as I mentioned, working to integrate the tariff line concordances and the rules of origin. And we have also integrated our database with uh, Power BI, which is a data visualization tool to create filterable uh, dashboards. Additionally, our economists have incorporated preference utilization data into their economic modeling of FTA benefits in the last few years. And now I want to quickly show you a few charts and Power BI dashboards to demonstrate how we can use our database to study factors impacting PURs and to identify trends and outliers in the data. Uh, so in this first chart, we have plotted marginal tariff value uh, on a logarithmic uh, uh, scale on the horizontal axis. And on the vertical axis, we have the preference utilization rates. And uh, this is imports from Canada at the 10 digit level between uh, a 10 digit uh, tariff level between 2009 and 2020. So it represents a very large number of data points and gives us the ability to uh, take some of the noise out. And uh, as you can see here, uh, there is a, a pretty defined correlation between the, the marginal tariff value and the preference utilization rate uh, with it uh, preference increasing with higher marginal tariff value. Here we have the same graph uh, for the European Union data that we've received. So this is EU imports from Canada in 2018, 19, and 20. And as you can see, uh, the relationship is very, very similar to what we see with the United States. Although of course the uh, percentage of trade that is coming in under preference is much lower, although it has gone up each year. And this chart compares the utilization rate and the marginal tariff rate in a slightly different way. The marginal tariff value is again plotted logarithmically here. The orange bars are a count of data points with over 90% utilization, and the yellow bars are data points with under 10% utilization. This image shows the chart uh, loaded with the same US data as uh, the previous US charts. And you can note here that the count of under 10% utilization peaks at a much lower point and then the over 90% utilization, and also take note of the shape of each of those curves. And now when we look at the EU data, uh, obviously here the uh, under 10% bars are much higher uh, due to the lower utilization rate we see. Uh, but the, the shape of these curves is very, very similar. And uh, the distance between the peaks for the under 10% and the over 90% utilization is exactly the same distance that we see with the US data. 
So this analysis reveals a consistent pattern in the preference utilization rate versus the marginal tariff preference. And then, so this allows us to adjust our expectations of utilization rates based on the marginal tariff preference. And this is something that we can then uh, use as a modeling tool to apply these assumptions to individual data points to better identify outliers. And then uh, lastly, I will share a couple of our Power BI dashboards. Uh, this page uh, displays a world map and a tree map that are both color coded by preference utilization rate. Um, and this uh, graphic is filterable by country. Just click on the country, it will uh, reduce the scope uh, to just that one country. Uh, you can also filter the uh, HS codes down from the chapter level all the way down to tariff lines uh, by clicking on elements in the tree map. And then note all the filters on the right side of the page. They offer many additional filtering options uh, that are applied to all the elements on the page. And finally, a uh, second Power BI dashboard. This one is used for in-depth analysis of a single FTA. Uh, in this case, we've loaded our data from the United States. And again, all the elements interact with each other and the user can apply a host of filters to generate many different customized visualizations. And that brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, David, for this uh, very interesting and highly data intensive uh, presentation. That was very interesting. Um, unfortunately, we are a bit short of time already. Uh, we got many very interesting questions, and I'm sure that those questions are not only informing the discussion today, but will also be picked up in future events. Um, maybe I'd like to start with a question um, that is, how can the findings about preference utilization be used to engage more effectively with the private sector? And are there targeted programs and already in place and drawing lessons from the analysis of utilization? So this may be as a first question uh, to the speakers of this roundtable. Um, so what programs are there in place to uh, improve preference utilization for businesses? And also, please also feel free to react to some of the other presentations. So if you have other comments, questions uh, to those, uh, you're also welcome. Um, who would like to go first from uh, this uh, round table? I can see uh, that Bruno from the EFTA Secretariat is ready. So thanks, Bruno. Thank you. Um, and indeed, this is a very good point. Um, and here, um, although the EFTA study is, is quite new, uh, Switzerland, one of the EFTA members, has done it for, for a few years now. And, and, and it is exactly what they have done after finding the first results. Um, so they have developed a company service. Uh, and it's important to, to say that it's both on the exporter and the importer side. Um, and they found out indeed interesting uh, uh, results that they are still uh, reviewing at the moment. Uh, but uh, we can already underline that the importer's role is as significant as the exporter's role when coming to utilization of preferences. And another uh, track uh, that, 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 that is developing is indeed exchanging with uh, FTA partners that may have uh, similar information. And, and here uh, I can say that we already have an exchange with Canada, uh, actually David was, was there, to understand sometimes the underused of, 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 of data. And, uh, and of course, we will work towards exchanging more with, with all our partners. Uh, and, and here, of course, Chile and Turkey are actually uh, on the list. And we already had uh, some early uh, exchange when coming to data, and we hope to continue uh, to do that in, in the future, indeed. Thank you, Bruno. Um, I can see that uh, Ingrid Garrido from Chile also has her hand up. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, well, in the case of Chile, we have a lot of activities to promote the utilization of uh, trade agreements. Uh, we have an expert agency called ProChile that is in charge of um, of enhancing the capacities of uh, Chilean firms to export, um, to settlement the exportations uh, in different countries and spread the benefits uh, among exporters. And then 
in uh, 2019 at Supre in the institution when I work. Uh, the um, the trade agreement implementation and diffusion division was created uh, with the objective to spread among the citizens the Chilean trade policy. That mean, meaning there are trade agreements available for our trade operators. Um, the activities include uh, workshops, seminars, um, and round tables, and training um, training activities um, in regions of Chile uh, away from capital. Uh, and uh, it, that means that uh, we have a lot of initiatives uh, to communicate and promote the utilization among our, our trade operators. Thank you, Ingrid, for this. Um, I see also David Flasplum, your hand is up. Hi, yes, uh, Canada has a trade commissioner service that provides a whole host of uh, uh, supports to uh, prospective uh, Canadian traders. Um, and we have worked with them uh, in regard to Reference utilization data, that's still at an early stage, uh, but I have provided some uh, data extractions for certain sectors, for certain countries as requested. Thanks, David. And also see Özlem. Özlem, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, in our case, actually, in order to inform our exporters and um, especially SMEs, we have been organizing trading events and seminars. Um, in addition, we plan to conduct surveys in order to get more information about their problems, especially uh, in customs or other, other obstacles they face. Uh, this is our plan for the upcoming future. Thank you, Aslan. Um, maybe a follow-up question. We heard a lot about preference utilization in general, and we know what are more or less how we know how preferential trade agreements are used uh, or not used. But do we actually know what are the most frequent reasons why those preferences are used, claimed, or denied by customs? So, do we know of the true underlying reasons of why underutilization or utilization of preferences is is high or low? More of a philosophical question, maybe. I don't know if somebody of you wants to come in on this. I see Ingrid again, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, in the case of Chile, well, our analysis of trade uh, at agreements utilizations is very incipient, but uh, however, uh, we have obtained signs of the trade data that the underutilization is uh, much related to uh, the potential of savings uh, that the trade operators uh, can obtain from using the trade agreements. So uh, in the case of uh, Chile, uh, I think that the most relevant reason behind the underutilization is uh, the low savings that the trade operators uh, may obtain. Okay, thank you, Ingrid. So this is really relating to uh, the role of preference margins. Um, Kent, do you also want to come in? Yeah, I had two points that I wanted to make. The, the first thing that I, I tried to express in my presentation is, even for those products where origin is easily documented. So for agricultural products that are wholly obtained or for mineral products that are extracted, we find that preference utilization can vary and that's confusing. And for those goods that have a higher tariff rate where there is greater incentive uh, to take advantage of the preference program, we can still see that non-preference receiving countries are among the highest exporters to the United States. 
So it is possible for countries with low costs of production to overcome a high tariff rate. Thanks, Kent. I also see that David wanted to come in again. Yes, hi. Uh, it would be speculating for me to say that uh, this uh, is heavily related to compliance uh, to rules of origin, but it does seem that that's a significant factor. Uh, we are, as I mentioned in Canada, currently preparing a survey of Canadian um, producers and exporters to ask them, what are the barriers preventing you from accessing uh, preference under our preferential agreements? And uh, so we will have more concrete information uh, once we get the results of that survey. Thanks, David. Um, since we are close to the end of this uh, webinar today, I'd like to invite all the speakers from today for a last round of reactions or a final statement they would uh, like to give to all the listeners today. And then I would give the floor back to uh, the chairperson of the Committee on Rules of Origin, Madame uh, Laura Gaur. Well, one thing that I found uh, interesting from today's discussion is the commonality of issues across preference granting members that some of the, the issues that I pointed out, I saw mentioned in other presentations as well. And so this seems to suggest that it's not a problem that isolated to the United States, but one that uh, may persist across preferential arrangements. Thanks, Kent. I can see uh, Simon from the AFTA Secretariat. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, I think this was this exchange was was very fruitful for us and provided a lot of food for thought when it comes to uh, zeroing in now on, on the individual determinants of a preference utilization and rates. And same as Kanda, I believe that there are a lot of commonalities when it comes to our approaches. I also think that we have different building blocks uh, at hand that we can leverage. There's of course the the quantitative element, which in my view is is a good starting uh, point to recognize individual patterns. But then moving forward, you really have to zero in, uh, reach out to economic operators, uh, to partner states, uh, to partner states, and to identify uh, determinants. And and we have made some some very interesting experiences in this regard, and also um, came across some surprising findings. For instance, that there are oftentimes um, also intermediate agents which are uh, involved in international trade, whose role we should not underestimate when it comes to preference utilization. So I think this is a good way forward, and I think the WTO is also a, a very good forum uh, where we can exchange views and 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 bounce new ideas thank you thank you for those encouraging words um i'd like also to like invite our our virtual participants to take a, a final word today i see Özlem, please thank you very much for today's discussions and it was really enjoying to be part of it um uh, yes the, i think it was really beneficial to see the commonalities between many many parties and also um to to understand the overview of the situation when it comes to this type of analysis and uh, we will try to continue uh, in that manner and thank you very much thank you Özlem. um i also see uh, david please Hi, I want to thank all the other presenters. I will certainly be studying your presentations and may have some questions to send you. I'm interested in learning more about uh, some of your methods and, and uh, seeing what might be applicable to Canada, especially with regard to uh, looking at uh, rules of origin factors in preference utilization. Thanks, David. I also see uh, Ingrid. Uh, thank you. Um, I want to uh, thank everyone uh, for um, this uh, webinar. It was very interesting to hear your experience of uh, this uh, uh, kind of analysis. And I think that it's very fruitful for us to exchange these experiences because uh, we can uh, think on 
new indicators and new analysis methods and new um, data treatment methodologies. And uh, it, it will be interesting in the future to, to uh, enhance our, our, our analysis in this topic. And um, thank you. Thank you, Ingrid. With this, uh, we're coming to the close of this webinar. I will give the floor back to uh, Madame Laura Gower uh, to close this webinar. Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much, uh, Simon, for moderating this session. And I would also like to sincerely thank, thank all the speakers who have shared their knowledge with us today. And of course, um, let me also thank all the participants that have joined um, today's webinar. If you would like to consult today's presentations again, please note that they will be posted on the W2TO website together with a video recording. I wish everyone a nice afternoon and rest of the day. Thank you very much. <laughs>